Good evening. My name is Kimberly Robson, and I'm the Senior Director for State and National Campaigns with Save the Children Action Network. And it is my honor to welcome you to the 2020 Save the Children and Save the Children Action Network Virtual Advocacy Summit. In previous years, we've brought advocates from across the country to Washington, D.C. to learn new skills in advocating for kids and to meet with their members of Congress. But this year, everything changed. When we realized we would not be able to meet in person due to the COVID-19 pandemic, we knew we wanted to find a way to still connect with our advocates. advocates. During these difficult times, it is even more important for us to be connected, to be engaged, and to use our voice. Our thoughts are with those of you who have been impacted by the pandemic, whether through illness or job loss, job loss, or just the insecurity and uncertainty of when this will end. Thank you for taking time from your evening to join us tonight. While this year's Advocacy Summit looks different than previous years, it is still packed with inspiring guests, a look at our priority policy issues, and advocacy skills training to prepare you to have an impact with your members of Congress. We've adjusted our programming to have all the sessions focused on the COVID-19's impact on vulnerable children and how you can help. Tonight, we'll be talking about food insecurity in the US and how programs like the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program or SNAP can help assist, can help ensure that kids don't go hungry during this crisis. Next Thursday, we'll focus on how the pandemic is impacting vulnerable children around the world and the role the U.S. can play. On May 14th, we'll look at the impact on the childcare industry. We'll talk about what can be done to support childcare providers so they're able, able to reopen their doors to make sure parents have childcare options when America gets back to work. During our last session on May 21st, will give you all the information and training you need to participate in our National Week of Action that will take place the following week. As you attend the virtual sessions over the next month, we hope it will inspire you to get involved and raise your voice for kids. Together, we can make a difference for kids around the world who are being impacted by this pandemic and who don't have a voice in the political system. You can be their voice. Before we get started, please join me in sending a big thank you to Community Placing for sponsoring our 2020 virtual summit. Thank you to Community Playthings for your flexibility and ongoing support. We could not do our work without you. So let's turn our focus to tonight. We are so excited to have Mark Shriver, Shriver and Jose Andres with us tonight for an intimate fireside chat from their two respective homes as they social distance. Mark Shriver is the president of Save the Children Action Network and a senior vice president of U.S. programs and, and advocacy at Save the Children. Mark has dedicated his career to fighting for social justice through advocacy and service organizations, as well as elected office, focusing on advancing the right of every child to a safe and vibrant childhood. He served as a member of the Maryland House of Delegates from 1994 to 2002 and has written two best-selling books, Pilgrimage, My Search for the Real Pope Francis, and a memoir, A Good Man Rediscovering My Father, Sergeant Shriver. Jose Andres is a New York Times bestselling author, educator, humanitarian, and chef. He founded his nonprofit World Central Kitchen in 2010 and has since provided millions of meals to those impacted by natural disasters. His current work has focused on responding to the food insecurity during the, the COVID-19 um, pandemic. You may have seen him in the past few weeks on the cover of Time Magazine, on 60 Minutes, or on The Tonight Show with Jimmy Fallon. Before we start the, fire ch the fireside chat, we're gonna show you a quick video to highlight some of the amazing work that was done through World Central Kitchen last year. Go ahead and roll it. In Oregon, 
Church uh, in Pennsylvania. In Jefferson City, Missouri, in Ridgecrest, California. Church for Feds needs to spend across America. Kimberly? Yes. Um, can you, can, can Mark and Jose's videos be opened? I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. we just need to get your video on. Just one sec. Someone can turn his video on. Mark's video. Well, maybe I'm better off not being on video. <laughs> you can start your, can you start your video at the bottom of the screen? Do I start mine? It, I think you might be able to turn it on. Uh, just hit there button. we go. Okay. There you go. Jose, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you for having us on. I, my uh, version of that uh, fantastic video was garbled. I don't know if yours was as well. I'm sorry if it was. Uh, uh, was yours garbled? A little bit, but I'm sure people at home were was able to see it fine. I think the pictures were amazing, Jose. I mean, they're, uh, uh, the work that you've done all around the world is amazing. I think the introduction Kimberly gave you was great. I think, you know, just want folks to know that in our house, uh, you're the guy with the beard and you're the dad of Carlota and Inez and Lucia and the husband of Patricia. And everybody in the Shriver household likes the women in your life much better than you. So, that, happens. that happens, and I will agree with all of you. <laughs> You've got three beautiful daughters and a wonderful wife and beautiful wife as well. You're so nice to join us. And, um, I, you know, the one thing Kimberly didn't mention was that you've been nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. And I just, on behalf of everybody on this call, want to thank you so much for the work you've done. Could you just tell us for a minute, Jose, um, you know, I know you're from Spain, but uh, tell us just quickly how you came to America. I don't, I don't actually know that myself. How did that come about? So <clears throat> I would say I came twice to America in my early days. Uh, first, uh, I was in the Spanish Navy. I served a year and a half. And they put me cooking for the Admiral of Spain back in 1989. And I couldn't believe it because when I was very young, I saw a ship in the port of Barcelona. I was with my father and that ship was amazing. Four mast sailing ship, a tall ship. That was the ship that will train the midshipmen of the Spanish Navy. And everybody knew that you will have sailors that will volunteer to go on that ship that will travel around the world as the midshipmen will get their training. Mm. Since I was little, I was hooked with that boat. 
I asked my daddy, what do I have to do to go? He said, you have to do the military service on the Navy. I am doing the military service in the Navy and I wanted to go on that boat. But some people had a different idea for me. They put me cooking for the Admiral. I say, no way. I went directly to the Admiral and I told him, please, I want to go on that Navy boat. And he said, okay, let's do a deal. Cook for me, my wife, my family, six months. And as soon as that ship sails, I'll send you on that mission. He, he kept his word. I don't think his wife was very happy, but my life changed the moment I went on that boat six months around the world. First time I went to Africa, Latin America, Caribbean. I came to Pensacola mm -hmm. on the week that they were celebrating the Six Flags in beautiful Florida, an amazing celebration of every single flag that was part of the history of Pensacola. And then I arrived in New York under the Barasano Bridge like a true immigrant, uh, Lady Liberty, Elisa Island, and I arrive and I dock. We dock on around 30th Street on the west side. Yes. 30 years later, I open a restaurant in New York on Hudson Yard, where? On 30th Street, Right. In if you talk about the American dream, my friend, yeah. I believe in it uh, more than anybody. One year and a half later, one year later, after I finished my military service, I came back to New York to, uh, as a cook to open a Spanish restaurant. And I was supposed to come for six months. And here we are 27, 28 years later. Um, here I am. Uh, I am an American yep. uh, with an accent. And you became an American citizen a couple of years ago? Yeah, a little bit more. To the three... For four years already. Uh, my wife, I was, I wanted to do it before, but I was waiting for my wife to, to, to go through the same process because she worked in the Spanish Embassy many years. So at the end we did it together and we were very blessed that uh, we were able to, to do it with many great people. And then uh, uh, Justice Sotomayor, Supreme Court Justice Sotomayor uh, did a little ceremony at the Supreme Court and quite frankly, uh, I'm very blessed by that uh, situation, and here we are. So great. I mean, that's the American. Uh, that's the American story, right? It's a beautiful story. I mean, up to, uh, opening that restaurant on 30th Street right after you were there as a kid is. Uh, I didn't know that. That's fantastic. So let's uh, let's jump in. You, World Central Kitchen started. Uh, it's a nonprofit started 10 years ago, and you're obviously a great chef. I've eaten your food multiple times. Thank goodness. Um, so why did you get into the nonprofit? What, what spurred that? How did that come about? Well, my mom and my dad, they were nurses. Um, they passed away a couple of years ago. Mm. I always saw my dad, my mom, their friends going beyond their duty to take care of others, mm -hmm. uh, reading a book to children without family or taking for a walk an elderly woman that was waiting for somebody to take her out. And I saw those nurses often going beyond their hours of work and their duty to take care of those fellow citizens. Right. For me, that was um, very important. I think, uh, obviously, like many, many young Americans and many people around the world, I, I was uh, volunteering in my local church, uh, uh, some Red Cross work in Spain. But I do believe after my military service arriving to America, and especially when I go to um, Washington DC, 1993, um, two things happened. My restaurant was open across from the missing soldier's office. The missing soldier's office, many Americans know is the headquarters on that building, a red brick building on 7th and E Northwest where Clara Barton herself had her office. Clara Barton was the woman that took care of many if not all of the wounded soldiers during the Civil War <clears throat> on both sides. Thanks to her, the American Red Cross was created. Like my mom, like my dad, uh, and uh, she was a nurse. And it's amazing that she was able to create such an amazing organization in the middle of this repair, in the middle of chaos. And then I met Robert Egger, a good friend, a good mentor. He created DC Central Kitchen a few years before my arrival to DC, I joined him as a volunteer. 
you sharing my knowledge with fellow ex-convicts or homeless. And he had one idea. Let's make sure that we don't waste food, but more important, let's make sure we don't waste people. He told me, Jose, charity seems is about the redemption of the giver, when charity should be about the liberation of the receiver. Those words got very close to my heart. And ever since, I've been working on that path on DC Central Kitchen and other organizations. War Central Kitchen, Haiti happened, 2010, earthquake. I am right on uh, Cayman Islands. Something inside me said, I have to go. Yeah. Uh, when I came back to DC, I jumped on a plane. I landed in Dominican Republic. I drove to Haiti. And since then, I've been going back every year, multiple times at the beginning. World Central Kitchen was created on this premise. In emergencies, let's make sure we are there supporting other organizations and the people that are in desperate need for a plate of food. One plate of food is the beginning of a better tomorrow. And you've been doing that. Uh, I mean, I was really touched when you actually fed uh, federal government employees who were furloughed in uh, 2019. Um, so it's all sorts of disasters. It's been Haiti, it's been Puerto Rico, it's been the disaster uh, that, you know, when the federal government closed up, right? In um, the last uh, three years ago, I think we've uh, done more than 14, 15 million meals. Uh, the last big one we did was in Bahamas. Mm. where we landed four days before the hurricane arrived, yeah. Dorian. Um, we were the first NGO to land in North Bahamas. Uh, we took care of 14 islands. Um, uh, we did 75,000 meals a day with the help of six helicopters, two seaplanes, one boat with uh, helipads. It was the only way to feed everybody. We had to bring food and water to multiple people in multiple places. And we arrived, quite frankly, uh, we were very well next to UN and USAID, but we arrived 10 days before anybody even was ready to move. We are an organization that we are very, uh, very small in number of people, but we can go from 50 people that work in the organization to, in the case of Puerto Rico, 25,000 volunteers. In the case of Bahamas, 5,000 volunteers, like that. And we adapt very well to the situations. We usually never plan. We adapt to the situation. And cooks like me, we are good at that, adapting. Uh, you never know what's going to happen. If you plan too much, yeah. things never go as planned. So you freeze. If you are training your teams to adapt, nothing catches you off guard. You are always ready to serve, and you always are ready to adapt. That's what we do. Well, so we're all adapting now. Uh, I mean, we're doing a virtual conversation when we were supposed to be together. Um, so tell us a little bit uh, what's going on with the pandemic and the amazing work that's going on. <laughs> You're in 100 cities now, is that right? Yeah, uh, authentically, the number of cities we were having aboard today is more in 160, 170. Oh, wow. Uh, right now, we're doing close to quarter million meals a day. Quarter million. Oh, that's all paid for by by non uh, by foundations are giving you that money or is the government? Uh, a lot of individuals. Um, they see the work we do hands on, and we have a lot of one dollar donors, and and then we have other big ones. Right. Uh, give us this opportunity to serve. Um, on this pandemic, World Central Kitchen um, saw the problem way many months ago. Uh, usually, we are always very much thinking, preparing for the worst, even we are hoping for the best. And when we saw Wuhan coming, um, we kind of began saying, "Okay, if this hits America, what we will do?" Why we were able to deliver thousands of N95 masks uh, across hospitals in Virginia, Maryland, and DC, because we order them for our cooks. People are going to be thinking, "Why do you order them for your cooks?" when the Princess cruise ship was in the ocean in Asia and was trying to find a place to land, to dock, and they landed in Yokohama. By the time they arrived Yokohama, a team of World Central Kitchen was in Yokohama waiting for them. In partnership with Princess and the Japanese government, mm -hmm. we were able to feed <coughs> 
everybody the, inside the ship, 6,000, many of them American, 18,000 meals a day. Your folks go onto the ships or are they cooking off the ship and oh. then they bring the food in or how does that work? We've been doing uh, cholera um, uh, cases like in Haiti, like in Mozambique. Uh, in Mozambique, we did a very good job. In every camp we were, our teams were protected. We had three kitchens in Beira, north of Mozambique. And the systems and protocols we have to feed in situations of cholera, we make sure that we protect people and we protect the people, our people and the people we serve. Yeah. This is different because we've never been in such a situation, but cholera prepares us for this. So we arrived there and we had three, three areas, kitchen production, food arrival, and final delivery of the food inside. So we will have firewalls between the three areas mm. to make sure that we will be protecting everybody. Yeah. And where contamination will not be possible. We did the same in Oakland. Uh, Governor Newsom called us. By the time he called us, we were already there. Oakland was handled much better. Yeah. Um, by the powers to be. I think governor had a lot to do with it. In Japan, they decide to keep everybody inside the boat for weeks. In Auckland, they decide to take everybody out of the boat. Uh, was much better handled in Auckland. I wish the Navy learned the lesson of Auckland. Mm. Um, but that tells you that we were ready, ready for this. Auckland right now, we are feeding. But we began activating all the teams of Wall Central Kitchen and saying, if the city is closed, if the state's closed, we're gonna be in need of feeding people because NGOs are gonna shut down. Volunteers are not gonna be so available. Some NGOs are gonna run out of money. And all of the time we have to be feeding nurses and doctors in hospitals, homeless, elderly, firemen and police. That's what's happening. And that's what we're doing. But you know, um, amazing story when you talk about uh, being so flexible and clearly you're incredibly well prepared as well with that delineation of responsibilities. I wish you had told me we were having wine, Jose. No one, I, I have to have wine because like you, I know you've been talking all day. This is <laughs> what, I, what our it is, is A, today I stay home and it's been nonstop talking. So don't worry people, I, I think, okay. <laughs> This is the highlight of your day. My, my throat is so dry of all day talking. And as you see, I have a big voice, Mark. Yes, I know. <laughs> and my, my, my voice dries quicker than others. So anyway, I'm okay. Enjoy the wine. I, uh, so I just, you know, as you know, Save the Children is uh, working in rural America. And we started about eight weeks ago with Jennifer Gardner and uh, Amy Adams. A, uh, an effort to re uh, celebrities and ballerinas and actors and athletes reading books online on Instagram uh, called Save With Stories. And it provides content for young kids. Uh, and we've raised uh, money off of that, you know, $10 a pop, people making contributions. I think people are desperate for community at this point in time. And people are, are giving those, you know, $10 contributions. And we've been able to feed children in rural America where there aren't a lot of food banks, honestly, and there aren't a lot of the resources that uh, big urban settings have. I mean, you know, we're in Kentucky, you go to Lexington, we're two hours outside of Lexington, or, you know, you go to Sacramento and we're three hours outside of Sacramento. So that uh, effort with Instagram and Jen Gardner and Amy Adams and about 250 other folks um, has been great. And it's enabled us to, you know, as you know, Jose, Save the Children came into America in 1932 to um, feed kids after the Depression. It was the precursor of the federal lunch program. Um, and Kimberly, will you jump in here and talk? Uh, you know, Jose, there, you've got hundreds of volunteers who want to have their voices heard on this call. Kimberly, we, we have an action that we hope people will do to put more resources into feeding, right? Can you, can you just update folks quickly on that, please? Sure, absolutely. We'll give Jose a break on his voice so he can he can recover. Um, yeah, we we want it. You know, we've talked about the World Central Kitchen, Save the Stories. Those are ways our everyone who's joining the call tonight can get involved. But we also want to give you another option. Um, as I talked in the beginning about the SNAP, um, the Supplemental Nutrition Nutrition Assistance Program called SNAP, 
that's a program that helps feed families and kids um, who are in crisis. Because of, of the additional, there's an additional need right now as a result of the pandemic, Congress has allocated some additional funds, but more are needed. So we are asking each of you on the call tonight, whether you're joining from Facebook Live or joining from Zoom, to take a very easy action. We're posting right now in the Facebook chat, I mean the Zoom chat, chat uh, box, and then in the message on Facebook Live, a link that you can click on. All you have to do once you click on that link is add your information, hit send, and we will send messages to your senators and your member of Congress on behalf of you, asking them to increase funding for SNAP so we can have more resources to be able to feed, particularly those kids who are in need right now during this crisis. So we'll give you a second to do that. Um, we'll also, you can start putting in questions into the Q&A box and into the um, Facebook, uh, Facebook Live uh, message box, because um, we'll take some questions from the audience um, a little bit later on. So please take a couple of minutes to take that action. Um, and then Mark and Jose will continue. Kimberly, I know, um, I, thank you for that update there. And I think, you know, uh, Jose's work and Save the Children's work uh, really scratching the surface here. And what we really need is the federal government. Jose, you said it beautifully a couple minutes ago that leadership matters. And Governor Newsom out in California, uh, you know, has, has clearly shown that leadership matters. Um, I, I just want to ask you, uh, Jose, I know, pe I hope people are taking this action, right, Kimberly? And I know- Yep, they're taking the action, yep. Okay, and I told, Kimberly told me to not talk for a minute, but I, 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 I got to <laughs> ask Jose a, a question here. I, I saw something, Jose, the other day that you said that uh, food is a national security issue, right? And when you think of national, or at least when I think of national security, I think of, you know, guns and, you know, tanks and uh, F-18 fighter pilots and all that. What, is it, what do you mean by food is a national security issue? And do you think we really take that seriously as a country? Or will we take it more seriously after this pandemic? Yeah, as a country, I don't think we take it seriously. Uh, yeah. And planet Earth doesn't take it seriously either. And I think it's about time that we have experts on food, food production and food distribution next to the president of the United States. Yeah. Because I do believe we take food for granted. And when you take food for granted, problems happen. It's not any different than the attacks to America on September 11. Um, who was going to tell us that September 10, four planes will be hitting America in the way it did? If we take food for granted and we only leave it at the expense of the private sector, and I love the private sector to keep feeding the world, we may be for a very hard awakening. So right now we see the problems that uh, we are facing. Uh, restaurants shut down. Restaurants are super important for the economy in America and around the world. More than 10 to 12 percent of, of the American economy relies on those restaurants, yeah. plus all the indirect uh, 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 support that we give to farmers. And, and right now we have this photo of uh, farmers uh, that putting their harvest in the fields and long lines in food banks across America. Comes off. In, in one side, uh, the farmers cannot sell their product. In the other side, the Feeding America Food Banks Network don't, cannot keep up with the need. That's a big problem of distribution. Yeah. In this moment, the federal government should be activating um, the different resources we have at our disposal to make sure that on top of the health crisis and the economic crisis we don't have a humanitarian crisis as we speak it's already countries like in venezuela and other in the middle east yep. that we're seeing civil unrest because people barely can feed their families right now the worst can be happening during this pandemic is that we start having pockets of civil unrest in countries surrounding America, in faraway countries, and even worse, even in America's soil itself. That's why food is a national security issue. Uh, I think it was Napoleon Bonaparte who said that the army marches on its stomach. 
if the military gives so much importance to the food, imagine anybody else. Remember that canning, uh, to put food inside a can to preserve the goodness of the earth for weeks, months, or years, was actually created at the request of Napoleon Bonaparte that in 1800 was giving 10,000 gold francs to anybody who would come with the system to feed the troops in the battlefields. In 1810, Nicholas Appert, this French scientist, invented, created canning. So imagine the importance. You mentioned what uh, 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 the creation of your amazing organization, uh, uh, school lunches in America, really, at the end it happened after the end of World War II at the request of the Pentagon because they couldn't fulfill the needs of the army because American children, especially uh, Amer American young men, especially from rural areas, they were not being able to uh, uh, join the army because they were unfit, because they were undernourished. Right, right. And because of the request of generals, the school lunch program really was funded by Congress. So yeah. fascinating to see the role of the military in some of the programs that we take today for granted. So I told you that we have tools, that Congress has tools, that White House has tools. I think the number one thing that is happening, Mark, is that the White House and Congress, both parties, don't recognize publicly that we have a humanitarian crisis in our hands in America. Right. I think it's very important to take this moment seriously, is that without, without any drama, we recognize that there is a problem in our food production and our food distribution, yeah. and that if we put the assets at the disposal of the federal government, private sector, NGOs, we can tackle this problem, all of us, yeah. but if we don't recognize the problem, it's very hard to take care of the problem. No, uh, I'm just getting excited as you're talking. I mean, I think, you know, when you use that analogy, after 9-11, we created the Department of Homeland Security, which was putting together pieces of the federal government and adding some pieces to that, and then having that secretary report to the president. So why don't we have a Department of Food Security? And we, why don't you be the, the, the secretary of that and you know, pull together. I mean, we, we, you know, it's, we ought to be doing something like that. We ought to be thinking, we, food, don't you think? I mean, well, this is the biggest emergency and biggest pandemic in the history of our country. In the, in the history. And we are not learning the lessons from really 1918, 1919. Right. Many of the things that happen now happen over a century ago, <laughs> meaning you don't even need to be an MBA or, or a professor with multiple degrees. Right. You only need to read 1918, 1919 uh, local newspapers of the time to learn successes and failures back then. And only you need to apply those successes to today. And if we only did that, things will be much better. Uh, ad again, adapting and, and calling the shots ahead. Uh, so for me, this is fascinating because we're talking food to create the Secretary of Food, yeah, independent well, from USDA, independent from FEMA. Yeah, they're the cab cabinet secretary, Jose, and that's your job. No, you, you me. Me boots on the ground. <laughs> I don't know, but that'd be a good job. There's many good people, Mark, that could play the role. Me, I'm going to be pushing for Democrats and Republicans recognizing the importance of food in our country. This country, after all, was a country of farmers. Many of our founding farmers were farmers themselves. We need to go back to the basics. We need to make sure that food ain't the problem, but that food is the opportunity. And in this moment, more than ever, we need to be. So I was telling you about low-hanging fruits, right? Yeah. Uh, Governor Newsom three days ago announced a partnership with FEMA to feed elderly across the state of California. Why is this so important? World Central Kitchen, for the last 8, 10, 12 weeks, we've been partnering with more than 600 restaurants that we, we are able to reimburse them for the cost. And we use the local restaurants across 20 states to cover the needs of the mayors, of the governors, private sector, 
NGO helping uh, fulfill the needs of a city. That the governor of California has announced that is brilliant. So right now it's a bill in Congress that we are precisely trying to do this. It's uh, sponsored by Mike Thompson and Jim McGovern, uh, two great congressmen. Uh, we are trying to make sure it has bipartisan support. And this is smart because when the federal government can invest into a real solution that is the urgency of now, it's immediate, where we use the private sector, we use NGOs, and we use the federal government, this becomes a very powerful tool. If we can be doing the same in other states, we can be feeling elderly, we can be covering the needs of children, we can be covering the needs of some medical hospitals, rural areas, low-income families. All of a sudden, we are putting every dollar of the America, uh, of the federal government, at the service of handling the problems right now. All right, we're going to look into that because uh, you know, Kimberly, we've got, uh, as you know, three hundred fifty thousand volunteers, a grassroots army of people that are interested in what's happening to kids and food. Clearly, we're feeding the minds and feeding and filling the bellies of kids right now across America, in rural America. And we'll look into that and get back to because that would be exciting to partner with you on that. Jose, I, I want to uh, thank Community Playthings again. They're the sponsor of uh, this Advocacy Summit. I know Kimberly mentioned them at the beginning. They've been with us for a number of years. They're fantastic um, supporters of our work. I do know that we've got a bunch of questions on here. I don't want to leave. Now, my last question just give me 30 seconds on your experience. I mean, I, I've heard you talk in the past about how immigrants really do provide such a huge service to this country, uh, not only in the restaurant business, but you hear about the statistics of nurses and doctors in this country are immigrants. And obviously, you're an immigrant, and I love it. I mean, tell, me, tell us a little, I'm just 30 seconds on what that means to you uh, and how important that is to America. Yeah, I think all my life I've been an immigrant because even in Spain, a small country of 40 million, we always move from one town to another, from one uh, province to another. And I always felt like I was an immigrant, even in my own country. Mm -hmm. I've been blessed by being an immigrant. I think immigrants like me, we are riches. We are able to prove people that people far away, they are, we may be looking different and different accent and different color of skin or religion. But at the end, we all have the same values, love for family, love for country, love for community, supporting each other. We are all the same at the end of the day. Today breaks my heart when I know that thousands of dreamers are working in hospitals, putting their lives and their family lives at risk, hmm. when still they don't know if in a few days, weeks, or a couple of months, the White House and the Supreme Court may be kicking them out of America. Dreamers that are as American as you or me, because they arrived here when they were very little boys or girls with no fault on their own. This breaks my heart. Breaks my heart that right now the people working on the farms across America are undocumented. That if it wasn't for their work, we wouldn't be able to fill the supermarket of America so families like you and mine can have fresh fruits and vegetables. Yeah. The meat, the meat packing uh, factories that we see right now, they're full of undocumented immigrants working elbow by elbow. Uh, they want to shut, they're shutting them down because everybody is getting uh, sick because at the end we didn't learn the lesson. 1906, the jungle, Upton Sinclair. How it is possible, and I recommend everybody to read this book, that over 100 years later, the same things that Upton Sinclair was talking on his book, yeah. about the bad conditions of the meat factories and the way they were treating the immigrants undocumented over 100 years ago, to this day, they repeat themselves. So immigration reform is not a problem for America to solve. It's an opportunity for America to seize. In this moment, more than ever, they are playing a vital role. So as an immigrant, uh, I am so thankful for everything America has given me. But at the same time, I need to be calling what is right. What is right is that we stop looking like those 11 million undocumented don't belong to America. Because let me tell you, Mark, without those undocumented, probably America would, would not be functioning, especially right now, as it is functioning. So 
Let's do right what's wrong. Let's be true Americans that America always fights what is the right, just thing to do. It's yeah. about time that we recognize that those men and women are, they've been badly treated, we've been using them, and it's about time in this moment that we give them the support they need and yeah. that one day we hope they can be part of the American dream the same way I did. I think uh, I just wrote down uh, while you were, uh, not, not a problem to solve, it's an opportunity to seize. Did you make that up, Jose, or did you steal that from somebody? That one is mine. <laughs> it's a great, I mean, uh, I'm still pushing, I'm gonna push for you to be the secretary, the new <laughs> secretary of the Department of Food Security. Uh, Kimberly, before Jose yells at me, are there any questions in here? You know, okay, I'm okay. I'm okay. Fine, Mark. I'm ready to go with the, the Secretary of, Home, of Food Security. I'm serious. I mean, I think it, sound, think I think it gotta, sounds great. You got to think big, right, Jose? I mean, you said that. I think uh, every Republican and every Democrat I talk to about this, they all love the idea. They say what? Every Republican and Democrat I speak about this, they love the idea. Yeah, but then we got to execute on it. We got to hold them accountable. And that's why SCAN was created, Save the Children Action Network, is because people always say how much they love children. And the political leaders say how important they are. And then when push comes to shove, you know, they're not, we don't have a seat at the table. Poor kids don't vote. Poor kids' parents uh, don't make big campaign contributions. So that's why, you know, we're so grateful you're here tonight to try to fight what you've done. You fired us up to go out and work even harder for poor kids because. You know, people say it's great, but if they don't do it, they might, they're, not, they're BSing us. Anyways, Kimberly, are there any questions here? Because I'm all fired up now. That's all right. There's been lots and lots of questions. And before we get to those questions, we want to ask our audience one question. Um, and we have, we'll be coming up here on Zoom. And then on Facebook, you can put your comments in. Um, the question is, how, what, how has your cooking at home been going over the past few months? First, are you ready to challenge Jose to a cook-off? Um, have you been testing out a few new recipes and skills, or you've pretty much stuck to the basics, or you've been supporting local restaurants by ordering takeout? So we'll come back and get the results to that in a few minutes. But in the meantime, Jose, I, you're, I cannot you're vote. I cannot believe it. It's ridiculous. Uh, <laughs> they, they say the host, the, the host and the guest cannot vote. What, what, what is happening here? It's, I am an immigrant it's, it's, and uh, you're not allowing me to vote already? <laughs> What's wrong here? That's right. Look, we, we're, we're, we're tampering with the elections. We're tampering with the elections. Um, so we've had a lot of questions and a lot of the questions you kind of got into on the last round there. Um, but let's stay on the kind of the, the food piece here. Uh, we had a question about what do we do about families who lack access to fresh fruits and vegetables, especially in the rural area? You know, that's where Save the Children is yeah. working. And so what do we do about that? Um, I've been um, talking uh, often to the USDA, which they've been engaging. I would say the White House have been engaging, but then um, um, is uh, right now we have uh, underutilized USDA feeding programs like the emergency food assistance program, we are not maximizing its potential. The farm to food bank, we are not maximizing its potential. Local agriculture market program, we are not maximizing its potential. The senior farmers market nutrition program, we are not maximizing its potential. A specialty crop block grants, we are not maximizing its potential. It's plenty of bills to take care of the problem we have, but what's the issue? If we have the bill, sit somewhere and then the people that are supposed to be using those bills to the benefit of the american people we don't do anything yeah we can keep having bills coming down money allocated but then we don't do anything because it's red tape somewhere in the middle we need to start being more pragmatic we need to bring more like the the brain of the private sector into government and don't complicate life so much we have farmers right now that they don't know how are they gonna be selling products we have what we call food deserts in urban America and even worse, in rural America. Because rural America should not have food deserts. What the USDA should be doing, what Congress should be doing in the White House. We need to make sure that anywhere that we say there is a food desert must be a market open, sponsored by USDA in partnership with the private sector, 
in that town and with a local NGO. All of the sudden, USDA buys directly through the NGOs from the local farmers. Any extra food that they cannot sell in the upper market, we bring this food to this centralized market in that rural area, and we give you know, respect to the families. I don't want the families to be in line in a food bank for hours. Why those poor families that they have this snap card for vegetables and fruits cannot go to the market like you and me with their children and don't feel pity for them, but feeling respect, giving them respect. And if they have some money to buy something they want, they can put that money into the economy. If they have a snaps and they should be using it if they are uh, mm -hmm. in need of that, they go and they buy from the farmer's market all of the sudden, you are bringing respect to the community. You are putting the federal workers to bring respect to the community. You give a chance to the family to feel respectful and, uh, and honorable. Everybody wants that. They don't want us to feel pity for them. And in the process, you put the economy running. You give a first chance to that family to do better. All of a sudden, one day, they keep going to the market because they found a job and they don't need to get the snaps. You see, very complicated problems, they have very simple solutions. Sometimes, quite frankly, we talk, talk, talk. We right. preach, preach, preach. We clap, clap, clap. I feel we always preach to the same core and everybody claps at you when you give the idea. But it's about time we do more boots on the ground and we use those programs that sometimes are approved, but for red tape reasons, nobody uses. And at the end, it's simple. If a community doesn't have fresh fruits and vegetables, let's stop saying what we should do and let's open a market and let's bring those fresh fruits and vegetables with help from USDA, bring in some private sector, some NGO, like uh, Save the Children or Wall Central Kitchen, problem solved. We do this across every community in America. All of a sudden, we are stop throwing money at the problem. We are investing into the solution. Rural America is doing better. Families are doing better. We bring respect to the communities. Problem solved. All right, ask next question for Mr. Secretary over here. <laughs> I really, he sounds like a secretary. Um, this actually goes for both no, he of you. Right? That's, that's exactly why he should be, because he doesn't sound right. like That's exactly right. Uh, so this is, this is actually to both of you, and I think there's been lots of kind of different ways to frame this question. Um, and it's, it, there's the question about how, you know, how can people take out their frustration on what is happening and channel it in their communities and to get involved and, what can people be doing? I think there's, a, there's been multiple, multiple phrasing of this question in all the chat boxes. So what is Mark and Jose, what is your advice, the people on this call and what they can do to, you know, take out their frustration on how they're feeling right now? Well, I mean, I think, you know, uh, their participation here tonight on whatever this is, Thursday night at eight o'clock East Coast time shows that they're committed. I think, you know, Jose uh, beautifully said, we got to stop talking, talking, talking and put boots on the ground. And I think we've seen, Jose, you know, a real change in this country's commitment to early childhood education, which was one of Save the Children's big work uh, streams here, big focus in America and around the world is on early childhood education. And, you know, 12 years ago, 14 years ago, when we were talking about it in Washington, there was really no support and very little support in state governments. Um, when I was in the legislature in Maryland, which was a long time ago, we started that process up, but it's completely different now today, uh, where presidential candidates, at least on the Democratic side, have been talking about it. And a lot of Republican governors have been very good on it, but that's because people are putting pressure on their elected officials, as Jose said, putting boots on the ground, going to town hall meetings, going to the state capitol, writing letters to the editor, making a phone call, sending an email, and then when you're tired, doing it all over again. I mean, you gotta get the energy that this guy has and just know that you're pushing a boulder up the hill and when it kind of falls back and rolls over, you go back down, pick it back up and push it back up there. So there's not a whole, I mean, people are we're obviously in home, right, at home right now for most of us. And Jose, if you disagree, jump in obviously, but I think they ought to write, you know, just stay engaged, stay in that arena. It's that Teddy Roosevelt said that the credit belongs to the person in the arena, Kimberly. And you gotta stay in there, you gotta get bloody, you gotta get beaten up. I mean, look at those, the video we didn't see very well at the beginning. I mean, this guy's got helicopters and airplanes and something that came out of the water. I don't know what the hell that thing was, Jose, but he's coming out with food. We I used it in Mozambique first. And, uh, that's uh, you know, 
you're not taking no for an answer, right? That was the only way we could be bringing food to the northern parts of uh, Abaco Island because the helicopters early on, we didn't have any fuel in, the, in Abaco. Yeah. And so until the boat arrived, the only way we could access the northern part of Abaco because the bridge was broken was with that vehicle because I didn't have enough fuel to reach the northern part of Abaco and being able to make it back to Nassau. So that's why I brought that amphibious vehicle. That, I mean, it was simple. Uh, yeah. If I cannot get by helicopter, let's get by road. And because it's not a bridge, we need an amphibious vehicle. So at the end okay. of the day... What, what, what do you say to people that get discouraged, you know, that say the government is always going to... You know, them? I think uh, Western Churchill said it best. We are all looking for success in our private lives, with our friends, in our communities, um, with our country. And, and Churchill said uh, that success is going from failure to failure without losing enthusiasm. We need to be positive because <laughs> we are only, as far as I know, one time on this beautiful planet Earth of ours. And we need to be positive of the outcomes. And life is putting all these tests to all of us. And the test is that we have to overcome anything that is put in front of us. This is probably the first time that I remember, and probably first time ever, that all humanity is put to a test at the same time. And we, the people, those three amazing words, they didn't make it in our beautiful constitution and the creation of our country because they didn't know what they were doing. They knew what they were doing. We, the people, was a simple message. We need to, in moments like this, put aside politics, put aside uh, uh, regret, bring the people together and come up with the best possible solutions moving forward. So if you feel like you are unhopeful, like you feel sad, uh, that you are mad. Go to the shower and scream your lungs until you have no more air left. <laughs> Actually, this is going to be good for your health. Yeah. And when you leave that shower, put your clothes on and do whatever you can do in the area. If you are at home, by staying home, you are with the people. Because by staying home, you are saving the lives of nurses and doctors because you are not part of the problem, but part of the solution. By writing an email to your senator and congressman supporting, save the children, the World Central Kitchen, or whatever good idea is there, you are being part of the solution. By donating $1 to your favorite organization, you are being part of the solution. By shopping for the elderly next to your home that you know she is having a problem going to the market because puts her life in danger, and you bring some of those things from the supermarket that she or he needs, and you disinfect, and you do it in the right way, you are being part of the solution. At the end of the day, it's a small gestures by all of us that when you put them all together, we become a very powerful army of good. We need to weaponize empathy. We need to make sure that empathy wins. And if we're gonna be contagious, be contagious of good things of family, of love, of country, of empathy. That's what we all need to be doing. Be positive and understanding one thing. There's plenty of people in our communities, in this planet, in this country, in this planet, that they think different than us, that they think different than you and me. We need to start seeing that the people that think different than you, they are not your enemy. That actually, they are the people that are gonna be enriching your point of view. We cannot see others that think different than us only as our enemy, because then what's going to happen? Worse is going to happen. We need to start being people that listen to others, that have a respectful conversation about the issues that seems put us apart, and be understanding that the ones that don't think like us, actually they are enriching us if we do it in a civilized, loving uh, way. Empathy and weaponizing empathy will win the day. That's what I will tell you if you are feeling sad one morning. Scream your lungs out and then go showing the good thing is inside you and just be part of the solution. Part of the solution. I love that. Actually, it's really good. I mean, there's so many 
uh, beautiful themes in there from the great religious teachers too. I mean, from Teresa of Lisieux, the small things, Pope Francis talks about this, Judaism, Islam, they all talk about the, you know, uh, repairing the breach, uh, tikkun olam. Uh, you, you hear these things in the great religious, and we our political leaders have so often divided us. You're an immigrant, you're not an immigrant, you're black, you're white, you're gay, you're straight, you're Catholic, you're Jewish, or you're Muslim, whatever. We have so much more in common, right? I mean, that, the love of family, the love of our community, the love of our country, the trying to do better for our kids, it's just so frustrating. The political leadership is dividing instead of pulling us together. Kimberly, do we have time for one more or, or are we done? I think we're, we're out of time, um, but I do just want to we're encourage people. We're just getting going here with Jose, Kimberly. We're just getting going. Right. I know. It was real, I was, maybe people want to stay for another you know, half hour, but I think we might lose Jose's voice. No, no. Um, thank you, Jose. Well, let's, yeah, so, you know, thank you, Mark and Jose, um, for joining us tonight. Um, let's find out about the poll results. Even though, Jose, you couldn't vote, let's see where people came out. All right. 82% uh, of the people who were on the Zoom call took the poll. So that's some good, good returns for us. 14% are ready to challenge you, Jose, to a cook off. 47% uh, have been testing new recipes, 25% have been sticking to the basics, and only 15% are like me, supporting local restaurants by ordering takeout. So, um, but you've got, four, you've got 37 people who want to challenge you to a cook-off. So, you know, I'm sure they're, they're going to keep working, staying home, doing the right thing, and then they'll be ready to challenge you. <laughs> Thank you, Kimberly. And thanks again, Jose. Yes. So much for uh, coming. Thank you very much for what you and, and all your family do, Mark, and, and for the amazing work of Save the Children. I hope, uh, I hope one day organizations like yours will go out of business. I hope so too. One day organizations like mine will go out of business. Yeah. That means that we succeeded in what we dream. Uh, but um, yeah, thank you very much because you and your family and all your legacy, what uh, Save the Children has done, has been a great uh, influence in me personally, and, and, and you are one of the reasons we do what we do. Every time we bring a plate of food to children around the world, uh, always gives me a, a lot of joy, because at the end of the day, those children are the future of uh, who we are. So thank you. Thank you. Beautiful. Appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you both. And for um, all the attendees, I just, uh, we're putting in the chat box a um, quick survey. We would love to hear from you. What worked for you, what didn't work for you. This is new for us. We're used to doing this in person. We're doing this virtually now. Um, so we'd love to get feedback from you. Um, I'd also like to remind you that next, the next session uh, will be at the same time next Thursday at 8 p.m. Um, we'll be talking about the global impact of COVID-19 on the world's most vulnerable children. So we'll talk about a global front. We talked about the US today. We'll be talking about a global front. Um, so thank you so much for sharing an hour of your day with us. Um, stay health and safety safe. And we, and good night. We'll hopefully see you next week. <laughs>